The movies, American movies, were invented in New York City. Uh, and uh, the first things that anybody did with a movie camera just about were take pictures of the streets and sites of New York. This would have been at the turn of the 20th century when Edison and Biograph and the first little pioneer companies of the film industry took their cameras outside and photographed the city in what were called actuality films. And by the 19 teens, you had the first story films being made. But a decisive change happened when the talkies came in, because suddenly it became impossible to shoot on the streets of New York. It was just too noisy. So the city became a kind of a mythic presence in the sense that it was actually largely created in California. They did have establishing shots of New York, and they would have backgrounds that they would shoot here. But almost all the action, anything that involved dialogue, which is to say most of the movies, uh, had to be photographed in California. This didn't stop New York from being uh, a regular presence on the screen. In fact, more than ever was it popular in the 19, early 1930s, but it was a kind of an artificially constructed New York, uh, built on the back lots of Hollywood. Because it was being created in California and was, I argue, largely created by New York writers in California, I argue that it really was a kind of a dream city, a mythic city that was not so much a representation of the real place, but a kind of a projection of fantasy of what the real city could be, uh, sort of an imaginative version of the real city. As late as 1945, there essentially had been no real film production in almost 20 years in New York. There was a, an African-American filmmaker named Oscar Michaud uh, making films up in Harlem, uh, but that was just about it. That radically changed in a short period uh, around 1945, 1946, when a few daring pioneers began to try to do something different. You had Billy Wilder coming here to shoot some sequences for The Lost Weekend, and you had the film House on 92nd Street being made here, which used sort of doc some documentary aspects. But the, these were sort of bits and pieces of films. The great, great breakthrough, the great watershed, was The Naked City. The uh, origins of The Naked City are kind of interesting. There are many stories. The one, one I've heard is that uh, this young screenwriter named uh, Malvin Wald uh, sort of buttonholed uh, Mark Hellinger, who was a very famous New York columnist, kind of a kind of legendary character, and proposed this radical idea that the a Hollywood production team should leave the studio and go into the streets of New York and shoot a f an entire feature film on the streets of New York to tell the story of a homicide investigation that the New York Police Department was going to uh, do. He had been interested in writing this story. Uh, Hellinger was intrigued but um, sort of wondered, could it really be pulled off? Asked, well, how would you control the traffic? And how would you, uh, there were going to be shots on the Williamsburg Bridge. What were you going to do with, you know, how were you going to close that and so forth? And Wald sort of, I think, a little kind of um, blithely said, oh, we'll take care of that and we'll have the police do this and so forth. Uh, but that was at least one of the genesis of the, uh, of the idea of making this feature entirely on the streets of New York. A big influence on The Naked City was uh, with the European films, and particularly the films having just, just coming out at that time from Italy, we would now call the neo-realists. Uh, but those filmmakers like Rossellini and De Sica, you know, fantastic films, whole new way of making movies. Similar story, in their case, in Italy, you had the Cina Città, which was the big uh, sort of Hollywood-style studio. Uh, it had been under the hands of the Mussolini and the government all through the 30s, so none of the left-wing filmmakers could use it. Then it had been bombed during the war, uh, so it was substantially uh, unusable anyway. So guys like Rossellini and, uh, and De Sica and others said, well, let's just try making making films in the streets, and that's what they did. Uh, you know, uh, Rome, Open City, and uh, The Bicycle Thief, and all these other wonderful films being shot on the streets. Coming to New York in the 1940s, this is what I discovered, is they were extremely popular, uh, opening the eyes of the audiences and filmmakers as to what was possible. And that was certainly uh, something that I think Jules Dassin and the writers, Melvin Wald, uh, and the others were very aware of, that those films had been very popular. And it was time to make an American version of those films. Naked City was made in, you know, filmed in 1947, released in 1948, and so it's important to remember that uh, World War II was just over. It's our first real view in, a, in an important way of the post-war city. Uh, it had gone through the Depression, there hadn't been a lot built, uh, and then it had gone through the war, and its industry had been supercharged, and a lot of financial power had come to the city, and, very importantly, 
coming out of the war with America as the kind of unquestioned victor of World War II, uh, really New York was now ready to take its place as not one of a handful of powerful capitals of the world, but the really economic and financial and cultural capital of the world. But I also think it's there in a sort of subtler way. The illusions of the pre-war era are over. This is a, this is a very kind of open-eyed, uh, a lot of people had died, a lot of terrible things had happened, and you could no longer, Americans could no longer pretend that this was just a, you know, it was a very nice world and everything was very dreamy and everything could be very romantic, and they were ready for this kind of film, and in a way that I, I think you could argue they would not have been ready for it in 1939, for example. And on the other hand, you had a, a cadre of young filmmakers who had now learned the craft of filmmaking by working for the motion picture units of the uh, Army and the Navy and the Army Air Forces. And indeed, Malvin Wald, the kind of, kind of conceiver of The Naked City, had come out of the Army Air Forces motion picture unit and had been sort of thrilled by the sort of immediacy and power of shooting on location, working without lots of fancy lights and so forth. So that was sort of part of the pitch that he was making to Mark Hellinger to say, try that technique, this new technique, which audiences are lapping up. Uh, why don't we try it for a feature film? And there were a lot of questions as to whether it was going to even be possible. Uh, and it was possible with a lot of difficulty. They did have trouble having the police control the crowds. Uh, there were accidents on the site. There was one story about uh, at least one of the lead actors getting caught on a subway train and going the wrong way for a couple of stops before he could get back. And the whole film production had to sh uh, shut down. The film did go over budget uh, by, by quite a lot of money. Uh, but um, they were very, very happy with the results in the end. And the fact is, is that thanks to Helen they had very good cooperation for the era from the mayor's office. The film was shot on 107 locations, and it shows. Uh, it's not a situation where you have a very couple of scenes that were taken sort of around the same couple of blocks and to try to kind of cheat various parts of the city. They really went everywhere uh, in every sense of the word, all the variety of kinds of interiors that they went to and exteriors, and the different parts of the city. Traditionally, when Hollywood showed New York, they really meant Manhattan and not even all of Manhattan, but just certain parts of Manhattan, uh, maybe a few little neighborhoods of Brooklyn. But here, for example, you see um, the Don Taylor character, the second detective, lives in Astoria, basically, by the uh, newly built uh, Triborough Bridge, uh, in just the sort of place he really would have lived. That detective really, as a young uh, detective, probably only you know making about five or $6,000 a year, something like that, uh, trying to raise a family with a wife and, and a kid or two, uh, would probably have lived exactly in an area like that. A lot of the places are, are real places. The precinct house, for example, is on 20th Street. It's where the actual precinct was, where the homicide department really was. The building's still there. You can go look at it today, between, I believe, 7th and 8th Avenue. And uh, there are pictures, images of the uh, Universal Building, which was just being built. The scenes where they, you see the construction site, where they go up the construction elevator, was on a building, actual Park Avenue building being built. And no surprise, it was the building that Universal Pictures was going to have as their headquarters. So they got permission to shoot there. So that was the new Park Avenue coming into being. There are images over by the East River, which show what had been the slaughterhouse area of the city, where the Blood Alley, as it was known. And by the time the film was released, those buildings had been torn down to make way for the new United Nations complex that was going to rise there. There's the Squib Building, which is where the doctor has his office. Very elegant building designed by Eli Jacques Kahn uh, on uh, Fifth Avenue and 58th Street, uh, showing the sort of upper class vision of the city. There's the very nice, ordinary apartment house where the, where the murder victim lives. And there are lots of shots that were on the streets there on the Upper West Side. And then famously, they were able to shoot in the mortuary at Bellevue. Thanks to their connections to the city of New York, uh, through the mayor, Bill O'Dwyer, I think he had been, he was friends with uh, Hellinger. They were able to get permission to go into the actual building and shoot in the actual morgue uh, environs. And that was certainly something that was not only unheard of and had uh, never been done from a production point of view, it was uh, risque, it was daring to actually go into a place like that and shoot. Uh, it was part of the sort of the underside, the real underside of, of, of New York uh, or a big city. And that really was something quite dramatic. Ever see this man? He's a box fighter. Wrestler. <laughs> Wrestler boxing, what do I know? I sense it. Please.
He's a fellow uh, who likes to play the, uh, what you would call it, the harmonica. Although Naked City goes all over the city, it does kind of home in at the end on, on two places, the Lower East Side and the Williamsburg Bridge. And of course the Lower East Side is kind of a mythic place within the mythic city, uh, like Broadway and Times Square. Not as much anymore, but um, to audiences in the time the film was released, the Lower East Side was just a kind of a just a legendary place in the American imagination, in part because such an enormous portion of the American public had lived there. If they hadn't lived there, their parents had lived there, their grandparents had lived there, uh, they knew people who lived there. Uh, it was a place where a million New Yorkers lived, a million New Yorkers lived in this one district uh, at the, around the turn of the century in 1910. It was also uh, the sort of birthplace of so much American culture, so many important figures, the, the Irving Berlins of the world, for example. The whole generation of American musical songs had sort of come up from the Lower East Side, and that had been a kind of, uh, you know, really just a kind of, a, a kind of, I don't know how to describe it, a kind of cauldron of American popular culture. And uh, the great novels had been written, and there were all sorts of, you know, places and ways in which it sort of impacted the culture, but not least in films. There had been lots and lots of films. Anybody who had watched the, uh, all the Warner Brothers movies from the 1930s, many, many of them, if not most of them, Jimmy Cagney and Humphrey Bogart and those kinds of characters would be set on the Lower East Side. Very often, of course, that would be stage set would be would be studio lot Lower East Side on the Warner Brothers lot in Burbank. This was the real thing. Uh, dirtier, grimier, even more crowded perhaps than you, they would try to recreate in the back lot. Uh, and, uh, and a certain kind of a seedy grandeur to it. I mean, just this kind of long blocks, block after block of, uh, of this area. Just incredible density of people, density of stores, merchandise, these tenements, these five and six story tenements which had been built solid in the late 19th century, uh, which just jammed people in. And of course we go into one of those tenements, the murderer uh, Garza lives in one of them, and so we get an inside view and they photographed in there and they photographed in the stair halls. They were using new kinds of lights and lighter cameras that were allowing them, uh, William Daniels, the cinematographer, to actually work in a stair hall of a tenement, which was unheard of, and to get into the bedrooms of a tenement apartment, which is where Taylor and has the confrontation with, uh, with the murderer. So there was a kind of a fullness of its portrait of that that went beyond what, what it showed of other parts of the city. I think it really kind of tried to take you into the life of the place and show you that uh, I think the story is is that for all of its crowding and all of its density and all of its foreignness and strangeness, um, it was basically just like a big village. Um, basically, it was a place where kids played and, and people went to market and people, other people, elderly people sort of watched the world passing. It had all the parts of a population uh, that you would find in any village. It was just, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times bigger than any village or even any town. Uh, but that it wasn't unlike, in its deep structure, it really wasn't unlike uh, many, many places. Another thing about it which I think is very interesting is being made the year it was made, 1947, crucial year. Why? Because it was one of the very, very, very last years before television. By 49 and 1950, they had become, now you had hundreds of thousands of people watching TV every night in New York City, and the whole rhythm of life in big city in New York and then ultimately in big cities everywhere changed. People left the street. And what you see in The Naked City, in virtually its last year of existence, is a kind of a way of life, in a big city way of life, that began in, say, the 1830s, really, when you had the first big cities, and New York became a big city, uh, and lasted for over 100 years. And they caught it in the last moments. And you can certainly see it in the scenes down on the Lower East Side. The children are playing, the mothers are leaning out the window, the kids are playing downstairs on the sidewalks and streets and the little playgrounds. And uh, there's a, just a kind of old world life on the streets that you would associate with a, an Italian town or something like that. But that's the way people lived in New York too, uh, until that year or the year after, and then it would all change. The day's work is over now. 
people are on their way home. It's interesting because The Naked City, when it was made, was such a searing expose of life in the big city. But again, looking at it today, we see something very striking about it. The city it shows um, is basically an orderly city. Uh, ironically, although the story involves a homicide, a woman, young woman is killed, and it's very kind of scary in its way, the film goes out of its way to sort of explain to you that this is really an anomaly, that mostly this doesn't happen. At one point, the narrator even tells, uh, so, to, so to speak, tells a stenographer who's on the train reading about it in the tabloids that she doesn't need to worry that this doesn't really happen to stenographers. Read about that bathtub murder? I'll say, some figure that damn had. Again and again, you have the scenes in which, for example, Barry Fitzgerald in his police precinct is going to do a, an interrogation. But before he does, he goes over to the window and closes the window because there are children playing outside. And, uh, and those same children confront the, uh, some of the suspects as they come into the building and are sort of fooling around with them and playing around with them. Uh, there's that scene of the tennis players at the very end, which you see down just in the middle of this life and death sequence that people are just randomly playing tennis. Again and again, the film is telling you that the life of New York as a whole is an orderly one, that the city is basically a healthy place, that bad things do happen, and when they happen, they are going to be corrected, uh, rectified by the police. And if you want to think about it, and it's an analogy that Parker Tyler uses, is a sort of immunological uh, kind of uh, analysis, the naked city. Well, what does that suggest? The city is a body, uh, and it's been stretched out for us, naked on the table. And that's a, the idea that the city is an organism, and it's basically a healthy organism. But like any organism, it could catch a disease. In this case, the disease is crime. When it does, the doctors go to work, and the doctors are the police in this case, and they'll make it better again. Now, that wouldn't be such a big deal, except that uh, in the years after that, starting in the 60s, certainly into the 70s, with films like, uh, you know, The French Connection and Fort Apache, The Bronx, and, you know, a whole era of these sort of dy dystopic visions of the city, you really began to have uh, the idea that the city was not healthy. The order of the city was basically compromised. And the police really didn't have the, couldn't try to make the city better. Uh, in those films. They just could do the job they could, but there was no hope that they were actually going to correct uh, things and make it all better like a doctor. Uh, so that was a profoundly different uh, idea. It's all summed up for me in the image at the end of the film of uh, Ted DeCorsia um, running up the ramp of the uh, Williamsburg Bridge. And very early on, he, he's racing through there. He, he knocks over a blind man, or almost knocks over a blind man. Um, then breaks through the rope of uh, two little girls who are playing jump rope. And in that scene, literally, you could just see basically breaks the order, ruptures the order of the city, which is shown as a place where basically people sit and sun and play and families and so forth. And that's what the regular city is. And this guy is the aberration. He's the literally the, the, the rupture of the order. And um, it's a very, very different attitude than you would see years later, although I can think you would say that it's really, we may have come full circle. I mean, the city today is certainly seen as basically, yet again, a safe and secure place. Uh, it's the safest big city in the United States now. And films now generally present it as a place which is not without crime. There will always be crime in cities. But there's a big difference between a city, a healthy city that has crime, and a city that is basically crime-ridden and disorderly and unhealthy. And that's what you got in the 70s and 60s. Having made this film that was set all over the city, um, how do you end it? You know, what's the, what's the big finale? Where do you end it? What do you do? And I think they came up with a you know, brilliant solution. Um, they could have done a lot of different things. Um, they staged an extraordinary chase scene on the Williamsburg Bridge. And I think it was a brilliant solution for a couple of reasons. One was it opened the film up. So much of the film had been set in the kind of confines of the grid of the city and this kind of, um, the grid standing in for this kind of, um, the mysteries of trying to locate some, something and someone in particular. And now you've kind of, you've got your eyes on them and now you've just got to go get them, but you can kind of leave the grid behind. But it also worked not just because it physically opened up the film, but because it changed the mood and spirit and speed of the film too. You went from having this very patient step-by-step -step procedural storyline to now something completely different, a chase. And I think that um, the excitement, the visceral excitement of the chase, it's just one of the 
things that movies can do that no other art form can do. You can't, you know, think about it. You can't have a chase in a theater. It just wouldn't work. You can have a chase in a book, but you don't feel the chase. You feel the chase in the case of a movie. So it's an intrinsically filmic or cinematic device. And I think the realization, which was not unique to Naked City, but I think it's one of the great examples, that uh, New York City, uh, 20th century New York City, provided perhaps the greatest uh, setting for a chase scene that you could imagine. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. One, New York is, is devoted to movement, as, as you could argue no other city in the world is. Uh, it's, uh, all cities have systems of transportation, but none have systems of transportation of such variety and such complexity and in such interwovenness. Of all those kinds of things, you would say something like a bridge is itself what is it, in a way, but a kind of a monument to movement? I mean, what's a bridge for except to help people get from one place to another? That's its only purpose. So this gigantic structure is really kind of dedicated to the idea of movement. Well, how better to celebrate that, if you want to look at it this way, than by sort of superimposing one more kind of motion on it, which is this chase scene. Uh, but there's another idea too, which is that the 20th century city was such a rich uh, environment in the sense that first you start with a 19th century street grid that had been laid down at the beginning of the 19th century and built up substantially by the end of the 19th century, and New York was pretty much built up by, by 1900, um, with its avenues and its streets, and that's one kind of movement that we all understand, and that's where that chase scene opens. It opens in that kind of crowded streets, and he's, they're running through those more traditional kind of 19th century. But in the 20th century, New York superimposed on that 19th century grid these kind of um, super movement devices, uh, which either were imposed on top of or below the existing grid. So below you had this incredible subway system and these tunnels that were lacing the, the boroughs to each other under the rivers, and then the entire city had a whole second circulation system underneath it. And then on top, you had these astonishing bridges and uh, viaducts and aqueducts and all these kinds of things that were built on top and railroad trestles and things like that, but particularly the bridges. The bridges were the great kind of gesture that sort of came in and were added on top of the grid and very often in this kind of seven league boots way, kind of jumped, leapt across from one street to another and blocks and blocks at a time. And that, it seems to me, is what that film takes advantage of. Starting in the crowded streets, but then showing you this amazing uh, sort of um, superimposed, uh, superstructure, if you will, steel, amazing suspension bridge, it's the kind of thing it wouldn't really have been even possible to build before the end of the 19th century. It could only have really been constructed at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and here, sort of making New York into this insanely plastic, three-dimensional kind of place. Not just a flat place where you have some streets and blocks, as busy as they might be, but this kind of sculptural environment in which you can lift yourself above that whole busy world of the two-dimensional streets and lift yourself into the sky and leap over those, that city. And that's what that final scene does. And there's a kind of way in which Garza hopes to escape, in every sense of the word, the crowdedness of the streets, and particularly the crowdedness of the people who are following him, and ra races up to the tower and hopes, I don't know what he thinks he's going to do, fly at the top, but he doesn't, and he's shot. And the final scene shows uh, his gun in his hand uh, pointing down, and you see the body having fallen, and the escape didn't survive. And then in the background, you see the skyline of, uh, of New York, the, which recapitulates the opening shot of the film. And this is the city. And these are the lights. That a child born to the name of Vittori hung. Uh, I think you could argue that motion pictures were made for New York, and New York was made for motion pictures in the sense that uh, movies, and really in their traditional sense, they're big. They're, they're, they're just, they've got a big scale, so of course this big city, this enormous place, uh, is ideal for them. New York in the movies creates this extraordinary world in which you can live for the time, the two hours or whatever the film takes. Uh, movies are fast. They have to tell their story in 90 minutes or 100 minutes, something like that, very, very quick. Well, that, again, is ideal for New York. Things move quickly here. And also, finally, it just films. No one knows why exactly, but it just films. A director after director have always said, 
and it doesn't really matter where you put your camera, you get something in the picture. All of these things add up to why New York and the movies are such a good fit. And I think a film like Naked City shows that as well or better than almost any other movie of its time or ever perhaps. Um, it captures all of those qualities of the city, uh, its density, its drama, its fast pace, its complexity, its sheer visual power. Uh, all of these things you know, really, really come across in, in the film. And you do get the sense that this was a match made in heaven, that this really was um, kind of, you know, you, you can't imagine the Naked City being set anywhere else, and you can't imagine New York being caught as well by any other medium as it was in, in films like The Naked City and other films, which really somehow capture everything about it at the turn of the, at the middle of the century. You know, what it looked like, what it felt like, its social richness, its urgency, uh, its complexity, um, its endlessness.